Hello. Pastor John MacArthur wrote a scathing letter to California Governor Gavin Newsom. Let's discuss. Welcome to the Forge and Anvil podcast, where we embrace uncomfortable conversations about culture and politics to sharpen ourselves for the race set before us. My name is Connor. I am host of this podcast. If you'd like to support the show, go ahead and go to forgeandanvil.locals.com. We appreciate your support. Joining me is regular guest of the show, Michael Aper. Michael, say hi. Hi, friends. I am a Christian that wants Christian values to be promoted in our world and contrary to the ways of the world for the sake of righteousness. Excellent. All right. Well, we're going to dive straight into this story here. So this is a letter sent directly from Pastor John MacArthur straight to Gavin Newsom. And uh, there's there's a lot here in this letter. Um, I have uh, highlighted some of the best parts of the letter, or I should say some of the most context of the letter. Um, but I would encourage anyone to read the full thing, um, because even with my highlights, it's still a little lengthy. So bear with us. This is directly to Gavin Newsom from John MacArthur. Sir, Almighty God says in his word, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. Scripture also teaches that it is the chief duty of any civic leader to reward those who do well and to punish evildoers. You have not only failed in that responsibility, you routinely turn it on its head, rewarding evil and punishing the righteous. The word of God pronounces judgment on those who call evil good and good evil. And yet many of your policies reflect this unholy, upside-down view of honor and morality. In mid-September, you revealed to the entire nation how thoroughly rebellious against God you are when you sponsored billboards across America promoting the slaughter of children who he created in the womb. You further compounded the wickedness of that murderous campaign with a reprehensible excuse me, act of gross blasphemy, quoting the very words of Jesus from Mark 12, 31. My concern, Governor Newsom, is that your own soul lies in grave eternal peril. Each one of us will give an account of himself to God. One day, not very long from now, you will face that reality. Nothing is more certain. You will stand in the presence of the holy God who created you, who is your judge, and he will demand that you give an account for how you have flouted his authority in your governing and how you have twisted his own holy word to rationalize it. As you look over the precipice of eternity, what will your answer be? My plea to you, sir, is that you would not let it come to that, that you would not go to that day of judgment apart from receiving forgiveness and righteousness through faith in Christ alone. Our church and countless Christians nationwide are praying for your full repentance. Please respond to the gospel. Forsake the path of wickedness you have pursued all your life. Turn to Christ. Ask for forgiveness and use your office to advance the cause of righteousness, as is your duty, instead of undermining it, as has been your pattern. Michael, your thoughts. I'm curious to know, I mean, I I understand Gavin Newsom is, uh, I, I wonder what level of devoutness he would exercise. I understand he used that that quote from Mark 13 to say, uh, love your neighbor as yourself, and it's loving your neighbor to kill babies. Like, can you explain that a little bit more? Like, where where is Gavin Newsom's stance, and what has he ever done that promotes Christ-like biblical values? Well, that's definitely where there is the um, frustration, I think, on MacArthur's part. So ultimately, um, this was a billboard campaign. It says, need an abortion? California is ready to help. Learn more at abortion.ca.gov. And then right underneath it has, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these. Mark 12, 31. So that's the entirety of the context. So let's look back at Mark 9, 42, which says, whoever, this is Jesus talking, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, It'd be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. 
I think that's the general sentiment of, of uh, Pastor MacArthur to say, really, you're, ca you're using scripture to cause other people to sin. And certainly, I mean, out of all the texts that can be taken out of context, the most popular texts are the ones that are most often abused. Like mm -hmm. money is the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. If you just read the scriptures, uh, that's just an example. So here we have the uh, billboard campaign saying loving your neighbor. Do you know what love is? Mm -hmm. uh, love, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. Mm -hmm. So someone's probably going to, and someone probably has already read uh, Pastor MacArthur's letter to Gavin, and they probably said that wasn't patient and that wasn't kind, so that wasn't loving. What would be your response to that? I think there's room for admonishing one another in love, especially someone who claims the word of God, because... Uh, scripture says time and time again that we should hold each other to standards of loving and standards of conduct so that you know if someone else claims to be in christ then we had better uphold them to that standard and you know there's always judge not lest you be judged but there's also a lot of scripture for, throughout even Matthew on the Sermon on the Mount and even First Corinthians saying, if someone among you is sinning, go to them, compel them to do otherwise. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. So mm -hmm. we, it is loving. I believe it's loving to admonish one another for the sake of righteousness. And what Pastor uh, MacArthur does, he adds a pretty substantial addendum in his text where it's not just accusations. He leaves a portion of his text to say, I really don't want you to burn in hell. You're on track to do that and you're going to have to answer to judgment. And that's a reality. So please repent that's the that's the message i understand and really that's the message that is riddled throughout the gospels you know first john the baptist comes preaching in the desert of judea saying repent for the kingdom of heaven is near and then immediately after coming out of his own desert experience jesus takes up that message as well and calls people to repentance calling to re people to repentance innately involves calling people out of their sin and that's what I what it appears to be that that uh, John MacArthur is doing in this case for Nick Gavin Newsom. Yeah. Whoever keeps and teaches these commands shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven to go on from where you left yeah. off. And I think that that's crucial as well, because keeps and teaches. Um, ultimately, I believe that a a argument can definitely be made and i would say it's a correct argument that um the church has a responsibility to call the leaders of of um of a state to a higher standard i believe that the church really does have the role of being an advisor to the king as we see with countless uh, prophets in the old testament especially um and even examples in the in the new testament as well um but uh ultimately i, I do think that um, keeping and teaching um, is really what MacArthur is trying to do, is the teaching aspect especially. Um, and ultimately, I think he has that authority already to call out his governor when his governor is doing things that are blatantly um, against the word of God. But I think that bar is raised, especially um, for MacArthur's responsibility to address this the moment that um, Gavin Newsom, who, like you mentioned a moment ago, doesn't seem to profess any type of faith, um, casually throws out scripture um, onto a billboard like that to um, push a political agenda. 
Um, I don't know if you would agree with that, uh, with that sentiment. No, we're tiptoeing on the line with the separation between church and state. So he, part of John MacArthur's appeal is that he's saying, you know, that quote from Romans, uh, was Romans 9, 11, I forget, saying that as a leader of the state, you have an authority to uphold righteousness. Well, that's only insofar as that leader has agreed to be held to that standard. And there's certainly opportunities, through, there's instances of, throughout scripture where leaders have deviated in extreme ways from righteousness, but were being used by God. So mm -hmm. Hebrews reflects on the Exodus account and says that, that uh, Pharaoh was, or pardon me, not Hebrews, and that's Romans 9, saying that, that Pharaoh was used by God in his wrath and in his, his wickedness. So there's room for that. You can also look at the, like the prophet Habakkuk. Uh, Habakkuk appeals to God and says, how come you're letting our people be stripped out of their nation and all of Israel be desolate? And God says, Babylon was my judgment. <laughs> what are you going to do about it? So there's, there's definitely, it's not a be all end all to say that every single leader should always do what is righteous. And it's not really within the bound, I think, of of what is appropriate for a church leader to go to just any state leader and say, here's my morals, therefore they should be yours. Because that, that I think, is a separation of church and state thing. And I, I do believe in the separation of church and state because the state should be operated through representatives and those representatives should have personal morality not corporate morality so that's its own conversation yeah. well, but it is say... a different thing sorry uh, one thing i want to add is that it does make a difference that gavin newsom in that campaign used scripture because what that does is that invites anyone else who holds scripture as an authority to take serious offense we talk about cultural appropriation uh, that should be cancelable. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. Now, unless I was misunderstanding you, I think you were referring to Romans 13. If I, if I, unless I'm misunderstanding which uh, verse you were referencing there, um, mm. specifically about um, the, the role of a leader and um, yeah, uh, Romans 13. Ad adhering to authority. Um, now, yeah, I do... Romans 9 talking about Pharaoh and mm. his wrath. Sorry, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, and I, I do take some issue with um, with your statement about uh, separation of church and state. Um, I do think that that is a misunderstanding, it, just in terms of in terms of the way our our government functions, at least, just being um, being more black and white about um, what's actually written into our law. Um, separation of church and state is not a part of any of our founding documents. Um, mm -hmm. The the original um, location of that came from, I believe it was Thomas Jefferson. Um, if I get this wrong, I apologize. Someone in the comments is going to correct me so hard. Uh, but I believe it was Thomas Jefferson was writing to the Danbury Baptist community. Um, they actually wrote him a letter uh, expressing concern for how America was going to operate and whether or not the church was going to, or the, the state was going to encroach upon the church. And so actually the separation of church and state only came as a reference from um, Jefferson uh, writing back to the this Baptist community, letting them know that the that the state will not encroach upon the church in any way. So I do think that that is something that the separation of church and state is kind of a myth that's been blown out of proportion. Um, now, unfortunately, I do think that it's oftentimes used very conveniently for those who want to exploit it. Um, for example, I do think that um, <laughs> Gavin Newsom or someone like him, I don't want to necessarily say Gavin Newsom and attribute malice um, where there might not be any. I know there's a lot of people that probably will will think that uh, I'm being too kind, but um, ultimately, I think that there are individuals who would uh, like to say to MacArthur that he is violating separation of church and state. Um, at the same time, many of those individuals are okay with going to a church themselves and, um, and stumping for their own political campaign. 
Um, unfortunately, this does happen a lot with both both parties. Um, but I think one party is quick to say separation of church and state or accuse um, one side of Christian nationalism um, when it's convenient for them. But at the same time, Stacey Abrams, who's currently the Democratic nominee for governor of Georgia, um, if you look up the um, uh, YouTuber um, woke uh, woke preacher clips, you'll see that Stacey Abrams frequently goes to churches and stumps for her political campaign. And she is a, a high up in the Democratic Party. So um, all that to say, I do think there is a hypocrisy of it's kind of used when it's convenient for individuals. And, and I'm saying it's on both sides of the aisle. But um, that's just my my main um uh, issue that I took with your statement about um, separation of church and state. Now, if you believe in the principle, of course, we can talk through that, but I'm not sure if you were aware of that history. No, as far as the origins of that clause, not so much. Um, I mean, yeah, I understand that its origins are to protect the church from the state, not the other way around. So allow me to clarify a little bit. Um, when it comes to the, there's a lot of thoughts that I'm having based on what you've said. When it comes to the separation of church and state, I think it's good for them to be separate in both directions to an extent because we do observe religious freedoms and I wouldn't want that to be taken away because anytime there's been a theocracy of any type, be it Islamic in nature, which we see a lot of that going on now throughout the Middle East and in Northern Africa, but whether it's Islamic, Catholic, there's been horrible, horrible atrocities done in the name of the church on behalf of nations. So I, I don't like, I, I support in essence, separating church from state insofar as it it allows state officials to determine religious practices and for religious institutions to dictate state legislation. So what I'm, I guess what I mean by that is that the church shouldn't have authority in the state. The church should have authority over church goers. Yeah. So that's why I think uh, John MacArthur is entirely justified in confronting Gavin Newsom's campaign because he's using the text, the sacred holy texts of Christendom and abusing them with seemingly zero forethought or concern for the implications of that campaign for the Christian community. And I think it's largely thought that the Christian community is anti-abortion pro-life and if they're not i know that there are some brothers and sisters of faith that that are not pro-life for a variety of reasons and that's perhaps an entirely different discussion but when it comes to like christian nationalism christian nationalism is its own animal and that's not what i'm talking about and that's not what i ever hope to represent either because I think that's a term that's been widely hoard out to mean a variety of things and to smear conservatives at every angle. Yeah, absolutely. I definitely think that's a term that, um, that definitely, <laughs> um, has been abused. That's for sure. Um, I think if you were to get a room full of 20 people, you'd get 20 different definitions of what Christian nationalism is, as um, you and I have even talked previously in some of our um, episodes that we put up on our locals page for our, our supporters. Um, now, that being said, um, I, I think the big thing um, before I get too sidetracked on this, um, this issue of uh, separation of church and state, I do think that I, I think that ultimately we have to remember what kind of a, um, a a civic structure we have. And ultimately we live in a representative republic, which means ultimately um, I don't think that we should say a separation of church and state in regards to um, how some people would like to say it, which means Christians need to shut up and not have an opinion on subject matter of, of anything political or cultural or lawmaking. Um, I think I think what you're arguing is probably different than what I would say. Um, I, I think the again, 
similar to Christian nationalism, separation of church and state is used as a cudgel and is oftentimes abused because different people think that it has different extremes. Um, I think what you're saying is the church should never have the ability to um, to mandate anything. And I completely agree with that. I think that that should be yeah. the role of the government. Um, but at the same time, we do live in a representative republic. And I think that um, if 40% of the population are Christian Bible believing like individuals, then I do believe that about 40% of our uh, state legislators and our, our um, sheriff offices and our uh, mayor offices and our governor offices should also be, um, uh, be Bible believing individuals in those offices. Um, so, yeah. you know, that, that's a whole other, uh, whole other meaning than probably what you were initially yeah. getting at. And I think that, that it's important to clarify that because I do think that there is a a lot of individuals that think that uh, Christians shouldn't even run for political office. And I would definitely take um, major disagreements with that because I think ultimately, if, if the church, again, to use my example, is 40% of the nation um, and those 40% just never decide to run for a representative um, uh, political office, then 40% of the nation is not going to be represented in lawmaking and uh, other functions of our society. And I think that's important. Um, but I wanted to go back a little bit to some of Can MacArthur's comments. Just yeah. a little. Yeah, go ahead. I do 100% agree with you in that, that clarification. And I want to say that a, a Christian delegate of the state is spiritually obligated i believe to promote biblical ethics in their position and in the legislation that they promote yeah so i do want to be clear about that absolutely thank you for that distinction but go yeah, on. absolutely now i do want to go back to um some of macarthur's comments not necessarily his individual comments more of um of, of the idea of a harsh rebuking or any rebuking for that matter, um, you know, because different people may have different ideas of what's harsh. Um, you referenced a, a earlier uh, passage in Matthew um, where Jesus is saying it is better for this individual to have a millstone tied around them than to cause a little one to stumble. So, Michael, was Jesus a jerk? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to bother a lot of Christians, but uh, Jesus didn't come to make friends. He came to save souls and to kind of strip the pot a little bit. Now, the people, the person of Jesus, the historical person of Jesus that people have discerned was one way or another way in accordance to the four gospels that we have accounting of his biographical life, keeping in mind that each of those four gospels give a unique perspective of who the person of the historical Jesus is suffice to say the historical Jesus was not what some Jews would have wanted him to be as a Messiah, as a, as a rebellious leader against the state of Rome, but he wasn't making many friends among the Jews either. And evidence enough, he was killed by them because he came in and he confronted harshly at times. He, he rebukes religious leaders, calls them vipers. He calls them, hypocrites all types of different names that are not particularly flattering so at his time yeah i, I bet a lot of people called jesus a jerk <laughs> and yet jesus is the epitome of love because love is we've described what love is love is not um careful love is not always safe uh, the way that we, I, I want to be specific in saying safe in the sense that like guarding your feelings as much as it is promoting your righteousness. So <sighs> Proverbs 27, five says better is open rebuke than hidden love. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Open rebuke is love and i think that's that's the heart of that text there and it's an uncomfortable reality that frankly 21st century north american christians have a real hard time wrapping their mind around christians don't want to be controversial because when they get controversial they get canceled and when 
you get canceled, you lose your platform and you lose your influence. Mm -hmm. And there's a conflict of interest between our culture and the culture of Christ. So yeah, Christ by worldly standards, total jerk, but he also uh, died to save your very soul and has given you a roadmap for how to live your life in a way of righteousness so that you can share eternity with him and join in the absolute glory of that eternity. Yeah, absolutely. And what you said about love not being safe, um, it just brought me back to um, a helpful illustration that C.S. Lewis gives us in the Chronicles of Narnia. And I do believe that storytelling is very powerful because to me, this always stuck with me. And it's always been a great allegory for, I believe, the love of God, um, which is in the um, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe when um, when the uh, when when the children are at the home of the beavers and they're first being told about Aslan and they're they find out that Aslan is not a man he's a lion he's the king of all beasts and um, I believe it's Lucy asked Mr. Beaver is he safe and he says safe of course he isn't safe but he's good and to me that was as a child um, a very crucial um a crucial line of thinking to have embedded in me early the idea that um, safe and good are, are are not always one and the same. Um, and so they could be good without being safe. And I think that that is ultimately um, who this person of Christ is. He does say that he came to, um, to turn brother against brother and father against son and mother against daughter. And ultimately he's come to, to bring a sword um, that is not, uh, that is not uh, Jesus meek and mild, as the song often tries to put it. And I think it's important for us as believers to know that. Um, because I think that there are going to be times when we have to be controversial. Um, now, that being said, something that I've been really um, finding a lot of peace in is lately when I want to be controversial. Let me rephrase that. When I don't want to be controversial and I feel called to be controversial... Or perhaps I feel like I need to say something, but I'm not always sure if it's God or if it's me. I've really begun to rest in the idea that I can do my very best by looking to scriptures and seeing examples of the faith, whether that be uh, Peter and John telling the Pharisees, we must obey God over man when they were commanded not to preach, or whether that be Herod um, being rebuked by John the Baptist, who ultimately lost his head for it. Um, I can look back on these um, pillars of our faith and say that there is precedent for being controversial. And so ultimately, um, I do my best to use scriptures as my guide. And then when I feel like I need to be vocal about something, I just have to rest in the grace that I'm not going to get it right all the time. And there's going to be times where I'm going to be controversial and maybe it was a hill that I didn't need to die on that I chose to still try to die on anyways. But ultimately, I'm resting in the grace that his grace is sufficient for those moments of my failing. And hopefully, um, me not being silent um, will will result in a net positive as opposed to a net negative. Um, I don't know if you've ever felt similarly, but that's just something that I've been really um, resting in lately. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. The, the call of scripture is not to be complacent. And it never has been, and it never will be. And, you know, continuing to think about the person of Christ. Dr. Jordan Peterson's been putting out some stuff lately, and he's been partnered with uh, Daily Wire. He's put out some stuff that's gone viral recently, saying, in essence, a man who is good is someone who is capable of great violence and being capable of great destruction, yet choosing not to is what makes someone good. Someone who is not capable of great destruction is only weak and useless. Mm -hmm. I, today, I thought of that in the context of Christ, and it brings me to Revelation chapter 19, verses 15 and 16, where Christ is described coming in judgment with a sword coming from his mouth and his robes are dipped in blood of the nations who he has reaped in judgment. A lot of people really are uncomfortable with his imagery. A lot of people, a common thing that I see in the church, specifically in the church, 
which frustrates me to no end, is that Jesus of the New Testament is loving and kind and merciful and good and just, I just want to give him a hug and like curl up in his arms. But the God of the Old Testament is wrathful and angry and he strikes down civilizations. And it's like, first of all, that's just straight up heresy. They are one in triune unity mm-hmm. of of the Trinity and in essence homoousios mm-hmm. and uh, the, the image of Christ that I see in the New Testament is one who is promised to be a judge and we see that time and time again he, he throughout Acts the, the, the messages given by the apostles in Acts is that Jesus came we came as a witness of Jesus and he will be made judge over all and then Revelation 19, we see this image of a, we don't like to think of him as wrathful, but his wrath is only an extension of justice. And that justice is only made righteous through love. So love and justice must be together. So going back to what Dr. Peterson talks about, goodness is the capacity of great v- damage, great violence jesus is capable of greater violence than we could ever imagine and it's important to recognize that and it's important to read the passion narratives with that in mind that jesus being beaten tortured and stripped and mocked and spat on and hung on a cross was jeered at and said people were saying to him if you are the son of god come down from here where are your angels? Why don't you do something? And while he's blinded and blindfolded, they're beating him and saying, prophesy, who hit you? And Jesus is silent in keeping with the scriptures. Uh, so all of this in context, it, it makes me think of the absolute amazing might that is our Lord and Savior, that he could be so capable and just in his wrath, yet choosing to love. So if you read the Old Testament and see a wrathful God, check yourself, because we have a very merciful God in the Old Testament. In the book of Numbers, time and time again, he would be justified in the destruction of the Israelites, and yet he chooses mercy. Mm -hmm. And he listens to the plea of Moses. And that same God will judge us in the person of Jesus Christ. And the reality of that is that whether you want to think of Christ as a jerk or not is kind of irrelevant because Jesus Christ is the almighty God and he will come and he will have justice. And he has made a way through the righteousness of his blood and the recompense through salvation. And if someone like Gavin Newsom is going to use these scriptures for political gain, and if uh, that other candidate that you mentioned is going to campaign in church to the end of of utilizing Christian platforms for worldly purposes, they Pushing will a have very to... pro-choice agenda as well. Yeah, that's it's horrifying. It is concerning. And what sticks out to me most of all in in um, McDonald's. MacArthur. Letter. MacArthur, pardon me. <laughs> McDonald's <laughs> a different theologian. Uh, MacArthur's letters, I love that he clown. does. I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> George McDonald. Anyway, uh, John MacArthur, is his message is, you've violated scripture on so many accounts, but also beware, repent. For the kingdom of heaven is near. And in that kingdom of heaven, to proceed to that kingdom of heaven, we're given explicit detail on the wrath and judgment of Jesus Christ. And he is justified and righteous and holy in that wrath. And if you're not willing to accept that, then search the scriptures for truth, because we do not serve a safe God, but he's good. And that's a, a really important understanding to say, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Hmm. Proverbs one. I mean, that's yeah. 
the theme of Proverbs. So Absolutely. what does it mean to fear the Lord? People don't like that notion of fearing the Lord. And we like to say in the church that it means more like respect. No, fear the Lord because yeah. his wrath is imminent and his wrath is justified through holiness. Yeah. So fear the Lord and in that fear be be compelled to accept the loving mercy of Christ because there's no other way. Yeah, absolutely. We're running low on time, but I want to end with maybe an analogy that might be helpful um, for our listeners. Um, and it's the idea that Christ is, Christ is a double-edged sword, right? So on one side, you have full justice and proper justice. On the other side, you have love and mercy. And he is one and the same at the same time. And it's important to um, understand that idea because you can read the scriptures. And when you're focused on one attribute of, of Christ, such as how loving he is, you are going to see scriptures that align with that mindset. And you're going to think, man, the Jesus of the New Testament is such a loving guy. And you'll kind of gloss over some of those other scriptures that we reference, which, by the way, we focused on New Testament for the most part tonight. Um, and then, of course, if you are focusing just on the wrath and judgment of God and the justice that he will ultimately bring, um, you could easily overfocus on those things. So um, ultimately, um, John Eldridge did a great job of, of uh, uh, he said in his book, Wild at Heart, um, some individuals like to treat Jesus like he is, he is a Mother Teresa. Um, I prefer to see him as a William Wallace. And ultimately, is he William Wallace or is he Mother Teresa? He's both, depending upon who he's talking to. To the woman caught in adultery, he was Mother Teresa. You know, he was Jesus meek and mild. He said, go and sin no more. That was the only rebuking she received after he saved her life. But then, of course, we do see Jesus threatening a millstone. And not literally threatening him, but saying it is better for a millstone to be tied around your neck than to cause a little one to stumble. So, ultimately, sometimes he's going to be William Wallace for the people that he needs to be William Wallace towards. And sometimes he's going to be Mother Teresa or a Mr. Rogers figure to, to the individual that needs to see that Jesus meek and mild, not to say that, you know, these imperfect figures of history are, are, uh, uh, something that Christ needs to look up towards, um, just to use them as examples that will hopefully be a helpful illustration. But that being said, we're basically running out of time here. So Michael, where can people find you? Well, I do want to make a clarification on our last episode, uh, our last episode talking about Halloween. I said that I would be studying conjugate vowels. That's not even Greek. Conjugate verbs is what I meant to say. So you can find me studying the scriptures desperately because I know nothing better to do. Amen. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for listening, everyone. We have been Forge and Anvil. And if you are interested in supporting the show, feel free to go to forgeandanvil.locals.com. We really appreciate your support. And we will start to post some articles up there as well. So that is a new thing that we are, are doing. So feel free to check that out as well. Thank you so much for listening. Have a good one.